the Dacha couple, thank you very much. They not only know everything about cannabis and can tell you everything, they are doing everything. And you guys are making a good start. I'm sure some of you had already in actually doing something to get this uh, plant legalized. Right, um, uh, um, Elaine will be introducing our next speaker. Elaine, would you like to come up? Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Our next speaker is a small-scale farmer. He's also a biologist. And when he's not traveling internationally, attending international hemp farming conventions, you'll find Arne quite literally handing out 15,000 homegrown moringa seeds at a time to developing communities, teaching them how to grow this South African superfood. Now, a few years ago, Arne decided to step away from his theoretical research to get his hands dirty, quite literally, in order to understand the practical challenges that small communities face. And he's got an incredible passion for interesting and unusual crops, including ethnobotanicals such as this one. And to be honest, we couldn't think of anyone who's more spirited, passionate, and with such a superb, broad knowledge base of plants to share with you his incredible knowledge in order to introduce this plant to you this morning. So I'd like you to please join me in welcoming Arne Fuhoff with his topic, Meet the Plant. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <coughs> the morning hasn't started, and I'm already getting high. <laughs> so I'm all about useful plants, plants that can give us things. I like plants that can provide us materials for industry, for making clothes, or for building houses. Plants are very versatile in this regard, and when they're sustainably grown and processed in ecologically sound ways, they can give us a ladder to help us climb out of this environmental and social grave that we've dug ourselves. I like plants that provide medicines in plants, there's a remedy for nearly every malady. We shouldn't forget that, that plants have formed the basis of all medicine throughout the ages, and even the great majority of modern Western medicine is based on these compounds. And of course, I like plants that do stuff to our brains. Because from the day we were conceived, either through divine invention or simply as creative but uh, anxious apes, we've wanted to play and shape our cognitive experience. We've wanted to mess with our minds. It's in our very nature, and we're certainly not the only animals that like to get high. There's, over 400, uh, there's nearly 400,000 species of plant on this planet but a singular one stands out far above the others as a prime candidate that can provide us with all of these things. It provides us with materials uh, from which products can, uh, can be made that are renowned for their great green profile, their strength and their durability. Which products? Anything you can imagine, really. It delivers these materials in opulence and over very short time periods. The plant provides us with medicines <laughs> and the list of disorders uh, that they treat are, is literally growing by the day. Many see this plant as a near cure-all because it works on a, system, uh, on a system in our body that whose job it is to keep everything running smoothly and in balance. And yes, this plant can tinker with your noggin 
every day, m millions of people use it for exactly this purpose. They use it to bring about profound insights or to boost creativity. Some simply use it to de-stress after a long day at the office or in the fields. Other people use it as a religious sacrament. And others still, God forbid, to, to explore the deeper recesses of their, of their own consciousness. I am, of course, talking about Dacha. Hemp, Ganja, Boom, Bangi, Pache, Parkigras, Ntsangu, Rondkeik Twak, <laughs> Mary Jane, Majat, Zol, Wacky Tobacky, Pot, Marijuana, Cannabis. It's one of the first plants that, uh, that were cultivated by man, and it's been celebrated and condemned, worshipped and despised. It's been an invaluable item of trade and has served to connect people throughout recorded history, as it does here today. The plant that we today call cannabis originated somewhere in Central Asia some 34 million years ago. It's impossible to tell exactly where it originated from because it's been associated for, uh, with humans for at least the last 12,000 years. And we've taken it wherever we've gone. Cannabis is an annual plant, and we don't call it a weed for nothing. It is hardy and shows tremendous plasticity, rapidly adapting to new environments and naturalizing to an area, to the climate and the light cycle. Cannabis is what's known as a pioneer species. These are plants that will, col uh, that will first colonize disturbed sites as those created by human habitat, uh, by human settlement. Its usefulness and, and weedy habit has, has allowed it to travel along with humans. In most, uh, in most cases, it doesn't even have to walk itself. We merrily took it along wherever we went. The only record of seed saving by an African slave shipped off to the Americas is actually that of cannabis seeds. If we look at genetic analysis, we'll see that uh, uh, cannabis varieties from the Americas are very closely related to African cannabis species. So possibly this poor guy was successful. Human selection for for the many uses of the plant has, uh, has had a profound impact on its biological evolution. And this can clearly be seen in the morphological, anatomical, chemical, and physiological uh, differences that plants show from different areas. Additionally, because it's been traded and transported, it's been cultivated, then escaped cultivation, it uh, developed uh, characteristics to suit its new range, then escaped, uh, uh, sorry. then escaped cultivation, uh, uh, then re-entered cultivation, and then still interbred with wild and, uh, and cultivated populations. Modern breeding has further pushed these characteristics to the extremes. A whole continuum of expression therefore exists, and this is clearly visible in the massive variation this one plant shows. Cannabis can range in height from a lowly half a meter to over six meters. It can start to flower in as little as two weeks or take several months. There can be as many as a thousand seeds in a gram or as few as 15. This diversity, the many uses of the plant and the many cultural, um, uh, and the many cultural traditions surrounding the uses of this plant makes it impossible to place it into one convenient box. I can literally spend my entire time simply speaking about the botanical classification of cannabis or the geographic variation it shows. I won't, though. It is often divided into three species, cannabis sativa, which mainly refers to plants from Europe that are grown for, the, for, its, uh, for their agricultural uses, Cannabis indica, which refers to drug-type plants that are used for highs in medicine. And cannabis ruderalis, referring to very small weedy plants that grow in the upper parts of the northern hemisphere. 
This taxonomic understanding is contentious, and it certainly doesn't help us. For all its diversity, it is likely only one species, Cannabis sativa. Think of dogs. You get big dogs and small dogs. Dogs bred for hunting. Dogs bred purely to be companions. Wild dogs. But a dog is a dog is a dog. All dogs can interbreed and create puppies that are more or less intermediates between the mom and dad. The same goes for cannabis sativa. So let's keep it simple. Cannabis can be broadly classified into two groups. Hemp, which is cannabis that's used for the raw materials, its fibers and its seeds, and what we would call daha, cannabis that is specifically used for its medicinal and mind-altering properties. This last group can then further be split into what the cannabis community would refer to as sativa and indica. Sativa plants are plants that grow very tall, with thin, light green leaves and a long growing season. Indica plants are short and bushy, with broad, dark green leaves, and they generally start flowering quite soon. Sativa plants are said to produce a mind high, uplifting and creative, and perfect for daytime use. Indica plants are said to produce more of a body high, sedating and relaxing, and good for nighttime use. The plants produce these effects mainly because of the concentration and ratios of the different cannabinoids they contain. The cannabinoids are, of course, the compounds of interest, and, and present many therapeutic applications. The most famous cannabinoid of them all is THC. And this is what gets you high. There are, there are, however, many cannabinoids, and they are found in abundance in this plant. They work by locking onto or otherwise influencing the endocannabinoid system, which is a system in our body which is mainly responsible for maintaining homeostasis. Simply put, maintaining a balanced, stable environment, uh, a balanced, stable internal environment, despite the external. Uh, the fluctuations in the external environment. The endocannabinoid system has been fundamental to the evolution of all mammals, like Flipper, and us. Many would argue that similarly, cannabis has played an essential role in human evolution. It certainly played an essential role in human civilization. The plant was first harvested for its fibers and its seeds. Uh, the, stem the stem was used in many of the very first technologies that essentially got us to where we are today. Think rope, cloth, and paper. The seeds are really good brain food in the form of protein-rich seeds that are also high in essential fatty acids and other key nutrients. Still to this day, Agricultural cannabis, or industrial hemp, is used for its high-strength fibers, the woody core, and the nutritious seeds. Hemp can actually be used to refer to many types of cannabis, but today has, often has a legal, uh, a legal definition that generally limits the THC content. This means that hemp cannot get you high. The planting of hemp has seen an explosion of growth, and this crop has become a symbol for sustainability, green living, and a bio-based society. This year, Europe has seen record harvests, while Canada, while Canada is going from strength to strength. China plans to grow a million acres of the stuff, and still they can't meet demand. The plant can be grown without pesticides or herbicides, and it's ready to be harvested in as little as 12 weeks. It can feed into hundreds of industries, potentially making thousands of products. People are building houses with it, making clothes, building cars, or making fuels. They're even 3D printing with the fibers, making anything possible. Of course, the eager harvesting for these materials by ancient people inevitably led to them discovering its medicinal and mind-altering properties too. 
Cannabis gets you high. Everybody knows this. Some people love it. Others don't like the feeling at all. Others still, busybodies who've never tried it in their lives, take it upon themselves to tell other people, hey, you're not allowed to feel that. It's hard to explain exactly what it feels like to be high. Creativity is often stimulated, and it can bring about new perspectives or new ways of thinking about things. The high is greatly dependent on the setting and the situation, as well as the quantity and the kind of weed that you are ingesting. It's nothing to be scared of. Though cannabis can be used to reduce anxiety, in some people it can also, cause, uh, it can also bring about anxiety, especially amongst uh, novice users. Other not-so-nice side effects include an increased heart rate or cotton mouth where your mouth gets really, really dry. It will not turn you into Justin Bieber. <laughs> so as I mentioned, cannabis gets you high because of the psychoactive component in it, THC, or trans-delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol for short. It, it, it is one of the cannabinoids, a class of terpenophenolic compounds. They found extensively in cannabis with 113 different ones already described. They are frequently being discovered in other plants too, including a daisy that grows up in the Drakensberg. Most of the cannabinoids are concentrated in the cannabis flower, and I suspect it's this flower that uh, brings most of you here today. Cannabis comes from the, uh, the Greek word kanubis, which in turn comes from the ancient Sumerian word kanubi, meaning a cane of two. It gets this name because dacha is dioecious, meaning that different sexes occur on different plants, male plants with male flowers and female plants with female flowers. There's also monoecious plants, hermaphrodites, with both sexes on them, but I, I'm not going to go into that today. The male plants tend to flower earlier than the female plants and can easily be identified by their little balls. <laughs> they chocolate block full, full of pollen with a single flower able to contain over 350,000 pollen grains and potentially hundreds of flowers on a single plant. It's no wonder then that when they did a pollen count in Durban, they found that cannabis pollen comprised about 20% of all the pollen in the air. <laughs> Good job, Durban! <laughs> now, bees love collecting poll uh, pollen from cannabis, uh, from, from male plants. I suspect it's to get a good buzz going. But cannabis is actually considered wind pollinated, and the copious amounts of pollen that, that the male plants produce are able to, to travel vast distances in search of females to pollinate. The female flowers are classified as bracts and can easily be identified by the where's the pointy thing? <laughs> by the little pistils which are little hairs sticking out of the flower buds. The females have a high concentration of trichomes. What are trichomes? They're tiny glands that are found on all the above ground um, parts of the plant, but they're most concentrated and most dense uh, on the female flowers. They're incredibly complex structures, and they're virtual factories of secondary compounds producing, amongst others, the cannabinoids and terpenes. It's the dried flower buds that you, that you roll up in a joint to get high, but it's also where the therapeutic application lies. Many cultures have known about the medical applications of cannabis. The Chinese have used them for thousands of years, and it's from them that we find the earliest written records. The Emperor Shen Nung, uh, spoke of can cannabis 4,800 years ago and recommended it for nearly 100 ail ailments. 
fast forward to 200, uh, to, uh, the, uh, the second century, and we find the first written records for uh, the use of anesthetic for surgery. And this was uh, cannabis flowers ground up and mixed with wine. Sounds like a student night, if you ask me. <laughs> they could certainly remove a kidney without me noticing after some of those parties. <laughs> There's also the Siberian ice princess, Ukok, who was found frozen in the permafrost. Uh, she lived thousands of years ago and had some wicked tattoos, but was found with a large stash of psychoactive cannabis. She also had breast cancer, leading some to speculate that she was self-medicating. The Greeks recommended it for tapeworms or, and earaches, and also used it extensively on their horses. The Egyptians called it sashat, and even the, mu the mummy of King Ramses II had ca cannabis pollen on it. That's why they made hieroglyphics. <laughs> There's also the Indians uh, who celebrate it uh, both religiously and then use it as a medicine. And this is a sadhu, uh, uh, a, a sect that are, that are known for their cannabis use. <laughs> Victorian society got wind of the ben benefits of Indian hemp after an Irish ph physician William Oshognizi introduced it to Britain. This man was also the inventor of IV treatment, and he brought it to the Western world after he'd seen the benefits of cannabis tinctures on cholera patients. It was quickly incorporated into Western medicine as a cure-all for a host of diseases. Queen Victoria, for example, used cannabis tinctures to ease her severe period pains. In South Africa, Bacha has been around for hundreds of years, long before any Europeans arrived. It's been extensively incorporated into the traditional medicine systems and has been used against asthma and bronchitis, for insomnia, high blood pressure, as a dewormer, against diabetes, strokes, epilepsy, and general aches and pains. Now, my relationship with cannabis obviously didn't start with a fascination with making buildings from botanicals or pants from plants. It started from getting a buzz from the bud. My journey with cannabis started all the way back in 2004, when just after my 15th birthday, me and my mother and our, and our dog were in a terrible car crash. I hit my head quite severely, and for years, well, this injury resulted in near constant headaches and frequent debilitating migraines. It was certainly a hard time, and besides the headaches, I suffered from uh, depression and severe insomnia. I was on several opiates, eventually finding solace in popping lots of tramadol. I was on antidepressants, and extensively used the sleeping pill Zolpidem. I could develop quite a tolerance to that. <laughs> Things got pretty bad. My mother got called into school once. Your son is on drugs. <laughs> well, yes, legally prescribed ones. I was yet to try cannabis. After school, I moved to Holland. And when in Rome, you make fun of the Pope. Of course, I smoked Dacha. It's Holland. My favorite was, and still is, some high-quality Nepalese hashish. Very soon after moving there, I stopped taking my sleeping pills, not struggling to sleep. I stopped taking uh, any pain medication, not trying to dose away any headaches. And I was feeling a lot better about life and quit taking the antidepressants. I just want to add that uh, that's my first cannabis plant, and I would hate you to go, go away here today to think cannabis made me uh, choose that hairstyle. I had <laughs> bad hairstyles long before cannabis use. <laughs> After all these years uh, of, of trauma and suffering, this drug fiend gave me back my life. 
it, uh, I certainly think it saved my life, uh, both for myself and my physical pain and existential angst. The last time I had a migraine was several months ago, probably one of only 10 attacks I've had since, uh, since my time in Holland. I self-medicated. All cannabis use is therapeutic, even if the user, like in my case, might not realize it. Its use as a medicine has walked a long way, however, and today we know more than ever about how cannabinoids can be used to treat a whole range of disorders. The two main cannabinoids I'd like to highlight are, of course, THC and CBD. THC is the most praised cannabinoid, and dried flower buds can contain anything from 0.1% in industrial hemp plants to over 30% uh, in modern strains of marijuana. It, has, it is apparent that it has immense healing powers with pain-killing, appetite-stimulating, antimicrobial and anti-tumor effects, to name but a few. The next is CBD, or cannabidiol. It's the second most common cannabinoid and my personal favorite. CBD has been found to have potent anti-inflammatory effects. It's a painkiller. And, has, uh, and also shows anti-tumor effects. It's neuroprotective and antipsychotic, while helping against things like seizures, anxiety, nausea, and even schizophrenia. This compound also reduces the psychoactivity of THC, uh, mitigating uh, some of the more intense effects. Other cannabinoids worth mentioning are cannabigerol, which is uh, the building block of both THC and CBD. This cannabinoid is praised for its help in inducing sleep, as well as, it, uh, as, well as its apparent effect in inhibiting cancer cell growth. It's a potent antifungal and antibacterial, and a potential antidepressant. Then there's THCV, which is a cannabinoid found nearly exclusively in Southern African varieties, uh, uh, of, of cannabis. Unlike THC, which gives you the munchies and stimulates appetite, THCV instead suppresses hunger. It also promotes bone growth, for example, and is, prom and is showing great promise in treating epilepsy. When THC is subjected to UV light or left to age, it slowly breaks down into CBN, cannabinol, which has only moderate psychoactive effects, but pronounced sedative effects. It has other effects as well, and is a potent antimicrobial, showing activity even against nasties like MRSA. Remember what I said about CBD reducing the psychoactivity of THC? It is a fact that all cannabinoids work together, boosting, modifying, or reducing each other's mode of action in what is known as the entourage effect. This ability to work, uh, to work synergistically is a potent therapeutic tool. Ethan Russo and John McPartland famously stated that cannabis is not a silver bullet, it's a synergistic shotgun. These synergistic effects are broader than just between the cannabinoids, however. Terpenes, for example, are increasingly praised for their ther therapeutic assistance to the cannabinoids, modifying the physiological and psychological effects. Terpenes are volatile aromatic compounds that are generally employed by plants to attract pollinators or to repel pests. There's over a hundred different ones already described in, uh, already identified in cannabis. And it is these compounds that give the bud its aroma and fragrance. A common terpene is pinene, a monoterpene that is, uh, that is also abundant in pine trees. It has a fresh, herby smell and, and, and is recognized as a bronchodilator, as an antibiotic, and apparently also improves memory. All indica plants contain the, uh, contain the terpene myrcene, 
And this is at least partly to blame for that lazy-fying effect. <laughs> Myrcene is also found in hops and cloves and mangoes and has a floral, almost clove-like smell. It's pain-relieving and sedative. There's also caryophylline that's, found, uh, that's also found in black pepper. Caryophylline is a very interesting uh, terpene in that it also activates the cannabinoid receptors. If you chew black pepper um, with dacha-induced anxiety, if you're trying to find the safety buckle of reality, um, it quite, very quickly calms you down and takes away some of that uh, intense effects. Remember that. Now, with all these beneficial compounds able to interact with one another, emphasizing or reducing each other's effects, it is no wonder that whole plant medicines have often outperformed uh, single component formulations in clinical trials. The cannabis community has certainly embraced the whole plant treatment. All the strains available have different cannabinoid ratios and terpene profiles, and they can all provide different medical relief and subjective effects. You can easily order cannabis seeds online, and there's a daunting number of strains to choose from, from 100% sativas to 100% indicas, and everything in between. Many have imaginative names like Sangoma or God's Gift, Alaskan Thunderfuck, Grape Ape, Banana Rama. All of them are straightforward to grow. And there are plenty of ways that cannabis can be grown, with lots of information available online. There's growing equipment and nutrients for sale, and grow gurus a dime a dozen. No matter how you decide to grow it, though, growing good cannabis is an art requiring dedication, uh, requiring dedication, uh, patience, and careful observation. Everybody can grow dacha. Not everybody can grow good dacha. How do you use cannabis? The classic way is obviously smoking the dried bud, or indeed hashish, which is the trichome, separated and often compacted. They are considered the traditional ways of uh, getting your fix. For medical use, and sometimes recreational use too, extracts and tinctures are often used. Tinctures are cannabinoids that are dissolved in alcohol or other solvents. A popular way is also in oil-based tinctures, using coconut oil or olive oil. Uh, I use marula oil or even butter. Various purified extracts are also available these days, and they range in potency from anything from 5% to nearly 100%. They, they are called dabs or honey, shatter, uh, uh, or BHO, amongst others. This is a piece of rosin. Um, for, it's uh, when you extract the resin uh, using heat and pressure, and it's a really nice technique because you don't have to use any potentially harmful so uh, solvents. Now, the renewed interest in cannabis as a medicine, especially amongst the general public, is arguably because of what we call Rick Simpson oil, or RSO. This is a concentrated extract made famous by uh, the American Rick Simpson, who cured his own skin cancer with it. It is often referred to as FECO, or full extract cannabis oil, and can be made using various solvents. I would recommend an ethanol-based one, uh, if this is the way you want to dose. The, canna the cannabinoids are first extracted in the solvent, after which the solvent is then evaporated, resulting in a very strong tar-like substance. The strength and the composition of FECO uh, can vary widely, and if this is the way you want to dose, be sure to know where you're getting it from. 
These days, cannabinoid analyses are available and cheap, meaning that providers have no excuse in not providing you with these details. These are just some of the ways that cannabis is available these days. And there's also a whole, a whole range of ways that you can actually consume it, depending on your preference or what you're trying to treat. It can be smoked in joints and blunts, pipes, chillums, shisha pipes, bongs and bubblers. It may be vaporized in dab rigs and e-cigarettes. Smoking is a very effective way to get cannabinoids into your system as it goes uh, directly through the lungs into the, brain, into the bloodstream and gets taken directly to the brain. It has a really fast time of onset, meaning that it's an easy way to control the dose. The effects generally don't last very long and dissipate within an hour or two. When cannabinoids are taken orally, either in a medible or as an alcohol or, or uh, oil tincture, the cannabinoids are first processed by the liver and can take a really long time to kick in, anything from one to four hours, and they can last up to eight, uh, up to eight hours or more. But this can be very intense. <laughs> You can, eat, uh, you can eat cannabis in everything you can think of, from space cakes to gummy bears, cotton candy, or ice cream. Cannabinoids are also absorbed by the skin and can be delivered using lotions, creams, or oils. I am personally surprised at just how, how well cannabinoids can, uh, can absorb through the skin. And this makes for an interesting targeted treatment. Uh, for painful joints or muscles, for example. Now, cannabis extracts can also simply be taken in capsules, either down the throat or up the... as suppositories. <laughs> now, some people tend to misjudge how much to take, seemingly not believing that tiny, uh, that tiny amounts can have such profound effects. These people tend to get really, really high. Many get a fright and don't ever want to take it again. But they were silly. It is possible to take vast quantities of cannabinoids, but your body needs to build a tolerance. So start small and then work your way up from there. But don't worry too much. They are remarkably safe. The only the only record of overdose that I could find was a Brazilian man who got crushed to death by half, a ton of this, uh, by half a ton of weed he was carrying when he had a car accident. <laughs> Clearly, too much cannabis uh, for the human body. No matter how you decide to consume cannabis, dose dacha or medicate majat, you may be sure that it will help your body in one way or another. Cannabis is leading the way to friendlier, more holistic medicine and a kinder, more sustainable society. Cannabis is just a plant, but it is so much more. It's one plant with three lives, providing materials, medicines, and mind alteration. This plant has played a critical role in all of human history, it's the most versatile plant on the planet and will help us define the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arne. Thank you. I think that was a fascinating talk and it's unraveled a lot of the mysteries of cannabis as well, in, as, well as reinforcing uh, the fact that it's an extremely useful plant and there's no way it should be actually banned. But what Anne forgot to tell you is that at the, end of the, at the end of the day, when everyone else is at the bar, if you don't want to buy booze, he actually brought all his psychoactive plants up here. This is his arrangement and he's going to have a tasting session of these plants later, so join him there. It's tea time, guys. Uh, I'm not sure how long we've got. What is it, 15 minutes? 20 minutes. Um, the tea is uh, that side and the toilets both sides. Thank you.
Yeah, we'll be starting again at 10 to 11. Yeah.